find the prison. How, how long have we been here? A couple months. How about you? Saturday. Okay. About Saturday. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Hola, welcome everybody. Botazi, good afternoon. Bem-vindos. It's a it's a great pleasure to have you all here in person today as we continue our Brazil Lab community building events and we look forward to an exciting return to in-person events. And we are we couldn't be happier in this momentous day that we soon will hear about Brazil's bicentennial to have such a stellar group of critical intellectuals with us today, Angela, Miguel. And also, I want to particularly thank Deborah Yashar, uh, Pierre's new director, who is gracing us with her presence and insight as this incredible political scientist that she is and helps us to think comparatively what's happening uh, today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, democracy and authoritarianism uh, in Brazil. So, so this is going to be an exciting year, so we will welcome you all to check our events on the website, to enroll on the listserv. And, um, and we also want to acknowledge our growing partnership with the School of Public and International Affairs that's helping to co-organize this event. And um, please stay in touch, check our events, and we want to invite you all to join us afterwards upstairs in the atrium for a welcome reception. So again, thank you for being here. Muito obrigado e... Let's go. Tomás, our associate director, will introduce the event. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, uh, once again, good afternoon, boa tarde, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Uh, welcome to what this is the, the very first Brazil Lab colloquium event of the year. Uh, uh, repeating a little bit what Joan said, I'm Thomas Fujiwai, I teach economics here at Princeton uh, and uh, associate director of the Brazil Lab at the uh, Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the School of Public International Affairs, the Program in Latin American Studies, uh, the Departments of Anthropology, and the Department of uh, uh, Spanish and Portuguese for their co-sponsorships. And also forgot to say, uh, also you know, good afternoon, boa tarde for everybody uh, watching at home or via YouTube to be more precise, since this is actually being live streamed, right, uh, to the world. Also, like, so you know, like, if you make a, ask a question, you know, this is being broadcast to the entire world, too. Uh, <laughs> not that we have any reason to worry, but I guess it's good to always say that, yeah. So, uh, uh, as most of you probably are aware, we're only 25 days away from Election Day in Brazil, where incumbent uh, Jair Bolsonaro is trailing former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva uh, in the, for the presidential race. However, this is not an quote-unquote, usual election following the democratic standards that uh, Brazilians have grown accustomed to in the last uh, decades, right? In his three, over, a little bit more than three and a half years in government, Bolsonaro has systematically attacked democratic institutions in ways that sort of fit a pattern we see in other parts of the world, you know, where a far-right politician engages in an attempt of uh, democratic backsliding into authoritarianism. Uh, in particular, you know, he has questioned the role of courts and frequently questions the electoral process itself, uh, mostly by claiming, without any evidence to support, that the Brazilian electronic voting devices are fraudulent, right? Many, if not most, political analysts uh, take this as a signal that Bolsonaro would not accept a defeat at the polls and will uh, most likely not uh, uh, engage in the peaceful transfer of power, as, again, Brazilians have grown accustomed to in the last uh, three decades or so. Uh, he has also turned today, which is, as John said, a momentous day. Today is September 7th, the 200th uh, uh, anniversary of the Brazilian independence, right? So he turned today into what could have been, I guess, a moment for you know, reflection and celebration into a, sort of a rally to gauge his support, both from parts of the society, also from Brazil's military, for his actions and his plans uh, for the, the, what might happen after an election. And so to help us make sense of this turbulent, turbulent political mo moment, we have three incredible uh, social scientists with us. Uh, first, we have uh, Angela Alonso, who's a professor of sociology at the University of Sao Paulo. She's also the director of SEBRAP, the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning. Uh, her award-winning work touches on the interface between culture and political action. Uh, and her most book is The Lost Abolition, the Brazilian Anti-Slavery Movement, 1868 to 1888. And second, uh, we'll have uh, Miguel Lago, who's a political scientist and visiting professor at Columbia University and at Sciences Po in France. 
he directed EAPS, the Institute for Health Policy, which is a think and do tank advocating for better public health policy in Brazil. He's also the co-founder of the nonprofit NASA's, a laboratory for using online tools for social mobilization and civic engagement. And his most recent book is The Language of Destruction, The Brazilian Democracy in Crisis, with uh, Eloisa Starling and Newton Bigoto. And uh, last but not least, as John also uh, introduced, uh, we're pleased to have Deborah Yashar discussing. Deborah is the Donald E. Stokes Professor of Public Policy International Affairs uh, at Princeton. She's also been recently appointed the Director of Peers, you know, the Princeton Institute for International Regional Studies, of which, uh, umbrella institute of which Brazil Lab is a part of. Uh, her scholarship focuses on democracy and authoritarianism, state making and citizenship, social movements, and immigration politics. Her latest book is Homicidal Ecologies, Illicit Economies, and Complicit States in Latin America. So this is our format for today. Uh, uh, Miguel and Angela will speak both for 10 to 15 minutes each. Deborah then will make a brief discussion and ask our present presenters questions to get our conversation started. After that, I will take questions from the audience and we'll have a conversation from the round. Uh, so thank you all for being with us today. Uh, Angela, if you can please start. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, a small correction, I'm a former director of SEBRAP. Uh, my term is finished, and I hope Bolsonaro's term will be finished as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you all for, for the invitation to be here again. Thanks in particular to João Pierre, who keeps inviting me. It's my third time at Brazil Lab. Always a pleasure. And it's also a pleasure to have the opportunity to share the floor today with Miguel Lagos and Deborah Yasha. Well, uh, walking down a street here in Princeton today, I saw a fortune teller ad. It promises to tell your future. And I believe you are expecting me to do the same and tell my country's future. I'm sorry to say I will disappoint you, since I'm a sociologist rather than an astrologist. <laughs> I will rather uh, tell you just about one of the trends that brought us to where we are today, the political violence trend. Today, as you know, is Brazil's Independence Day, a day that used to be a commemorative one. However, in the last few years, it has be became a dangerous one. Last year, the president used it to challenge the democratic rules. Today, as you can see here, it did it again in an exhibition of strength for his supporters. Many have been explaining Bolsonaro's performances like this one, as well as his government and supporters, in a newism fashion. The cheeses of the rising of a new right, new fascism, new populism, and etc. I believe the emphasis on novelty puts in the shadow a critical historical pattern, the use of violence to solve political conflicts in Brazil. I'll make four points around this subject. The first is that the political violence path has been denied in Brazil. One of our Many myths states Brazil is a pacific country and all its major political changes were not violent ones. There was neither an independence war in 1822 nor a civil war when the Republic replaced the monarchy in 1889 and even the military coup in 1964 would have been done peacefully. This narrative presents the Brazilian political elite as more prone to negotiate solutions rather than to enter violent conflicts. However, scholars in the last decades had been digging up copious evidence of political violence in Brazilian history. The dispute among political elites included violence during all the monarchy years 
and the Republic began with a civil military coup. In this book I co-edited with Eloise Spada, we studied 20 major cases of political violent conflicts, all of them involving the state, the army, and many deaths. They go since the Republic started until the 1964 military coup. In all of them, the political elite fought to subordinate people or fought among itself, split into factions. So political violence was frequent. And it became, of course, the rule during the dictatorship. My second point is that in the mid 80s, when democratic rule returned, the political violence was controlled. The new republic put together the 1988 constitution where civil, political, and social rights, as well as institutions to control political conflict, were stated. Many scholars and political actors assumed this was a step in an enlightenment path. Brazil would have finished the little conflict age and would enter in a irreversible, irreversible, something that you cannot go back, democratization path, as if democracy and civilization were a destiny. This rationale echoes the civilization process as described by Norbert Elias. <coughs> While studying French history, Elias pointed out the correlation of the manner sophistication of the social elite and the state monopolization of political violence. However, Elias also pointed out a divergent trajectory in the Germans where elites refinement and social pacification were not completely achieved and political violence remained a tool to solve conflicts, a path unfolded as Nazism. Brazil did not arrive at the same destiny, but never put violence completely aside in the social life. The Brazilian social elite have never civilized never accept equality as a rule for interpersonal relations. Rather, it kept the aggressive manners rooted in centuries of slavery. My point is that the civilizing process was never completed in Brazil in terms of social pacification. The support for the right of having guns is a proof of that. In the disarmament plebiscite in 2005, the Lula's government lost, and one of the leaders of the victorious pro-guns coalition was Jair Bolsonaro. Neither social nor political violence disappeared. The democratization process ju just put it under control. Both Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Lula understood this point when they tried to investigate the dictatorship's crimes and both governments proposed a national truth commission. Their actions faced setbacks though. Reactions circulated in the public debate as for example, the book, The Suffocated Truth. Its author, Brilhante Ustra, was a key man in the political repression during the dictatorship. The book circulated broadly on the internet and among the military. Facing reaction, both Cardoso and Lula stepped back. Dilma Rousseff did not. So the conflict came back when this former guerrilla became the president in 2011. In her inauguration, Juma insisted on the commission and expressed sorrow for the fellow death dead in the fight against dictatorship. Rousseff indeed created the Truth Commission in 2012. This decision called the military back to the public debate. Ustra himself and many others were subponents. 
The meaning of the military rule in Brazil became then a hot and national issue. Newspapers and social media discussed whether the military regime started as a coup or a revolution, whether the communist guerrilla was as or less violent compared to military repression. One side blamed the other for political violence. The Ossaf government left this conflict open. In the impeachment vote, Bolsonaro, then a representative, voiced the revolution against communism narrative. My fourth and last point is that when Bolsonaro was elected, there was social support for a leader like him. Many social movements arose in defense of military participation in public life and for the freedom of having guns. Bolsonaro was not alone. He represented part of the society, a moral community that shares his values. Around 36 of Brazilians will vote for him again. They are mainly white, middle-aged men. Some of them are middle-class, as Trumpists here, but many of them come from the upper class, in particular, evangelical entrepreneurs and agribusiness men, the ones that are in Avenida Paulista today. So Bolsonaro represents a large share of the society, including a portion of the social elite that never civilized, civilized itself. So the Bolsonaro election ended the new republic initiated with the 1988 constitution. It closed the times, political, <clears throat> the times when political conflicts were under control of the institutions. Bolsonaro's presidency placed violence as a regular tool in political conflicts. Gen uh, symbolic violence against minorities, gender violence, racial violence, and etc., and against political adversaries presented as enemies to be eradicated. The president also celebrates physical violence and attempts to militarize society, for instance, creating military high schools. Bolsonaro also counts on what Charles Chile called experts in violence, the collective actors competent to act violently, the authoritarian movements, the shooting clubs, the militia, and parts of the police. So he counts on most of the armed citizens and part of the armed institutions in the country. As Trump, he fears losing the election. But unlike Trump, he counts on support inside the army. How large, nobody knows. So part of the, the society is up to a Brazilian January 6th. To conclude, let me summarize. Brazil is a country with a long tradition of solving political conflicts by arms. The conciliatory nation is just a myth. Redemocratization did not pacify the politics for good, rather placed conflicts under institutional control. The Brazilian social elite never abandoned political violence because it's not completely civilized in the sense it never embraced democracy, meaning tolerance to the difference and respect to the rule of law as a way of life. The National Truth Commission was a key event to bring the military back to politics. So they did not come back with the Bolsonaro government. Bolsonaro just helped in their voicing. Bolsonaro represents a part of Brazilian society that thinks like him and supports him no matter what he does. His have supporters are organized in authoritarian movements or are common armed citizens. Unfortunately, this part of society will not demobilize if Bolsonaro loses the election. Thank you.
Well, hello. Uh, well, it's it's an honor to be here at Pierce at Brazil Lab. Thank you, Professor Yasha, for having us. Thank you, Joel, Tomás, Mikhaes, for the invitation. Uh, you gave me a, a really tough job, that is to speak after uh, Professor Alonso, brilliant presentation. Uh, I agree with everything uh, that she said. Um, and I, I think that, well, we, we, we've been seeing and we've been witnessing what Bolsonaro has done. Uh, and today, during the 200-year Independence Day celebration, uh, basically he did, again, a radical speech and uh, has been constantly threatening um, the Supreme Court, attacking the Supreme Court, attacking the electoral process. And, uh, and this is uh, something that, uh, again, for the moment, it's just words, but we don't know if this will have any consequences as uh, Professor Alonso just uh, presented. Uh, so, uh, so Brazil, it's a little bit, when we, we are listening to Bolsonaro, we're a little bit in a, the crossroads of two meanings of a Spanish word, which is pronunciamiento. Pronunciamiento means, in the literal translation, will be a pronouncement, a statement, uh, uh, something of the political speech, right, that all politicians uh, say. Uh, but pronunciamiento also means a military rebellion against uh, to overthrow a specific government or to change a political regime. So um, which one of these uh, meanings of the word uh, pronunciamiento will thrive and will prevail? only the next few months will uh, answer us. Uh, and the fact that we have this question, is, Go is Bolsonaro going to do a coup, a revolution, or an insurrection, or, or whatever, uh, it's, um, it it's, it's, it's really shocking, because this year, 2022, is the year of, um, of the 200, the bicentennial, as João just mentioned. So we should be discussing the 200 years of independence of Brazil. We could also be discussing the World Cup because we are we love football. We have a World Cup this year. And the central question this year is not, will Brazil win the World Cup? Nobody cares about the World Cup in Brazil in this moment. And we have also a presidential election. But the central question of this year is not who is going to win the presidential election. The central question is, will Bolsonaro stay or leave office? And again, it's not the same thing of winning the election because he can always do a coup or a revolution. I, I was very criticized today in Brazil because I, I published a, a, an opinion piece where I'm saying that Bolsonaro is not planning a coup, but a revolution. Uh, so I'm, I'm, um, I would like just to bring a few arguments uh, today uh, for why I think that there's that he's setting the conditions for an insurrection. Let's not call it as a coup or revolution, but for, of, a, of an insurrection and for an institutional breakup. Um, and so I think we have like four to five reasons to believe that he has the conditions for doing so. The first one is that clearly he's attacking the institutions. He has been discrediting the electoral process for the past three and a half years. Uh, so clearly he will not accept the result of the election unless he wins the election, which is also a possibility, but it's not uh, the, what is most probable uh, of happening. Uh, the second thing is that he has been... Uh, 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 doing rallies all the time. And it's amazing his capacity of mobilization of people in Brazil. So today, watching the videos in Brasilia, in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, but especially Brasilia, was really frightening to see hundreds of thousands of people. The government says there were one million people listening to Bolsonaro's speech. I don't believe in exactly the, the, the numbers that the government said, but certainly uh, at least 100,000 were probably there uh, listening to, to the speech, which is already very scary if we take into account that all the demonstrations against, against Bolsonaro were like 10,000 people going to the street, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, he has, uh, of course, he's discrediting the institutions, he's discrediting the electoral process, and he is uh, willing and, and he has the capacity of mobilization that other uh, political parties or all political uh, initiatives do not have at the same level. Uh, the third reason is that um, they are weaponized, as Angela just showed. Uh, I mean, um, we, if gun control in Brazil is much stricter than in the U.S., and uh, if we look at the numbers, so we have a special license in Brazil that Angela just presented, the CACs. Uh, so, um, and the CACs, they, they were like 100,000 people 
uh, that had this license of CACs in 2018. Now we have almost 700,000 people. Uh, so just during the term of Bolsonaro, uh, and this combined is more than the military police, which is basically the street level police in Brazil, and the army. Because if we if you look at our army, we have like 250,000 people. If you look at all of the police, the active police forces uh, in Brazil, the military police forces, it's more or less 400,000. So we could easily say that we have more people, more civilians, arms, uh, uh, and, and with the possibility of carrying a gun, which is something also different, uh, than uh, the amount of policemen and the army. And of course, Bolsonaro is extremely popular with the police. We have uh, seen many uh, police rebellions uh, during the past years, uh, and uh, all of them um, stimulated by the president, or at least by many of his supporters and collaborators. Uh, so we have reasons to believe that those uh, who, who, who he can mobilize uh, could, um, well, they are weaponized, not only mobilized. Uh, so, the, and the fourth one that is uh, that I think it's important is that he's, he has been strategically strengthening, uh, strengthening those constituencies. So uh, he has done a lot for the CACs, so enabling people to get guns and to carry guns. Uh, he has been um, has done many things for the police, for the army, uh, and um, uh, he has distributed many uh, uh, segments of public policies to the evangelical uh, pastors. Uh, which is also an important uh, support of Bolsonaro. And recently, he just approved an inconstitutional bill, uh, which is basically uh, where he gives money uh, to specific sectors that are completely aligned with him, uh, like the truck drivers, for instance, that has already blocked the country in 2018 and where he has a lot, a lot of support as well. So we could, we could imagine a situation where he loses the election, and he has uh, thousands of people going to the streets because when he calls people, people go to the streets. Uh, we can have um, those people are weaponized, so they could do something. We could also have police rebellions uh, in, the, in the, the whole country. And we could have uh, uh, pastors basically saying this is great because it's the fight between the good and the evil, so leg legitimizing this kind of action. So who would stop... Uh, some insurrection, some violent insurrection uh, led by Bolsonaro. Well, the army should do that, but as Angela said, uh, we don't know if the army wants a coup, probably not, but certainly they, they, they will never stop an insurrection uh, of this size. So, uh, again, uh, we, we have uh, reasons to believe that we have enough conditions for an insurrection if Bolsonaro Get, um, doesn't get reelected and uh, to, to, to stay in power. But again, it could be only words, just words, uh, because Bolsonaro values his speech uh, above everything. Bolsonaro is, is not willing to, uh, to, to, to conceal, to moderate his speech in order to win the election. It's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary because he has a radical speech and he keeps his radical speech like nobody else in the history of Brazil did, because normally in the presidential elections, you need to moderate your speech, always. And Bolsonaro, today, in the, in the celebration, he was as radical as, as, as always. And uh, so he's not willing to moderate his speech to win the election. So he values more his speech than the possibility of winning the election. Uh, and, and this, I think, it's important, because his speech... Uh, has been essential in the way that he governs. So Bolsonaro has not done much in terms of public policy, but he has destroyed a lot of public policy. He has identified uh, uh, enemies and he has antagonized with those enemies inside the public administration, calling them leftist or uh, corrupt people or whatever, and, uh, and has dismantled uh, important um, administrative institutions in Brazil. Um, when, when the virus came, Bolsonaro, instead of governing Brazil and trying to fight against the virus, as many of the countries, uh, many of our neighbors, for instance, Argentina, Peru, did, uh, what he did was simply, okay, so I need to fight against the idea that we need to fight against this virus. So he was antagonizing with the governors and the mayors who really wanted to do the right thing uh, 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 in terms of, of, of health policies. So, uh, so again, 
Bolsonaro has behaved much more as a leader of a revolution than as a president. His main goal is to keep a large constituency extremely mobilized, and he's not willing to concede or to do any kind of moderation uh, in order to uh, to do politics. His uh, what is what he values the more is uh, the the capacity of mobilization and uh, and the strength of this group. So again, it could. Be, it could be like Trump, like just a performance, like, well, with no, uh, with nothing to be really scared about, but it could be really something, uh, 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 an amazing insurrection that, uh, that uh, I think we're not at all prepared for that. So uh, that's, that's how I end my, my presentation. Thank you. And I just want to start off by welcoming everybody um, to the new academic year. It's the second. You can't hear. Never heard the hear you. This is what happens when you're short. <laughs> I'll start again. <laughs> no, no, that's good. It's good. So I, I'll just repeat by saying I want to welcome everybody to the start of the academic year. This is only the second day of classes. So first off, it's wonderful to see everybody in the room. It's wonderful to see everybody at the start of the year. And I want to thank in particular the Brazil Lab, not only for organizing this event and for the turnout that we see, but for all the work you've been doing over these past many years in generating not only debates about Brazil in particular, but the global issues that generate from uh, Brazil, whether or not we're talking about democracy or environmental sustainability, um, indigenous ecologies, uh, 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 development, and the like. So thank you, Joao, uh, Tomás, and Niquez for organizing just a wonderful set of events, this one um, in particular. I also, before I make my comments, want to thank um, Angela and Miguel for their excellent uh, comments, I have to say. After listening to this, I could speak for hours, and I'm trying to figure out what not to say as opposed to the many things I'd like to say. So thank you for really enlightening us um, about this particular moment, depressing though it must be, and it is. Um, at least we're here debating it, both trying to understand it and think of ways forward. So let me just say what I'm going to do. Um, and you'll stop me, uh, Tomas, if I speak for too long, because I already recognize I have a lot to say, is I want to start off by just making some global observations, as Joao said, as a, as a comparativist who works in Latin America, but not Brazil in particular. I'd like to make some global observations, starting with some optimism before we decline into the pessimism. And then I want to pose a, a couple of questions for both of our speakers and then zero out for some questions for all of us. And then I'll just I'll stop because um, that's more than enough. So on the global level, I, I want to remind us that comparatively, whether or not we're thinking across many countries, whether or not we're looking over time, whether or not we're looking at Latin America in particular, there has been some reason for optimism outside of the Brazil case alone when we think about democracy at, in general in terms of democratic endurance. Latin America has had the longest wave of democracy in its history. It also We've seen the decline of coups. We've already spent a lot of time, and we will again, talking about the course of state. But coups as such have declined in num numbers, although, of course, democratic backsliding has also increased over time, as our colleague Nancy Romero has noted. And over this period, there has been a series of inclusionary moves that we should take note of in terms of recognizing groups that had previously not been recognized, in terms of creating institutional avenues so that people have greater modes of participation, in terms of a redistribution of resources that had not occurred previously. So this kind of inclusionary turn over these many decades is something to take note of for the region as a whole. And Brazil has been a leader in many of these discussions, whether or not historically we've talked about participatory budgeting, whether or not we talk about um, uh, the, the uh, various initiatives that Cardozo and Lula uh, uh, implemented and the like. Inclusionary moves, democratic endurance, and the wave as a whole has been striking. However, and as you know, because the other foot and shoe is going to drop, there has been real reason for concern. And so if you look at the comparative work that has been done by VDEM coming out of Europe and their most recent 2022 20, uh, Democratic report, 
there is a real reason to be cautious. They look at regimes around the world. They have a four-part scale of liberal democracy and electoral democracy and electoral authoritarian rule. And I think the last category is autocracies. And what I want to start is by knowing that, yes, democracy has endured longer than it has um, in the region. But democracy on the whole throughout the world, not just in Brazil, is on the decline. And the number of liberal democracies, in other words, not just electoral democracies, but also respect for tolerance and the basic civil rights we associate with liberalism, is also on the decline. Having peaked in 2012 and having declined since then, we're back to 1989 levels if we look comparatively. Moreover, autocracy and democratic backsliding are on the rise, not because of military coups, I want to note, but especially because of anti-pluralist parties that have taken the lead in promoting autocratization, even if elections are maintained. So I want to quote from this because I want you to know the, the company in which Brazil um, uh, is placed. They say, quote, anti-pluralist parties drive autocratization in at least six of the top 10 autocratizers, and they include Brazil, Hungary, India, Poland, Serbia, and Turkey. So these are cases, of course, where people are being elected, but as our speakers noted, they are hollowing, hollowing out democratic institutions. They are challenging the trust in the institutions that are in place. They're challenging the sense that elections are elections to be trusted and respected. They're threatening violence in its aftermath, as we've seen so clearly. And they are recommending and by example showing that politics should operate outside of political institutions, even for the biggest decisions that are in play. So in this report, I want to really emphasize that for all the optimism that we can say overall, it's pretty pessimistic. And Brazil pops up repeatedly as an example of the kind of autocratization that is in place. The other Latin American company here would be Nicaragua, Venezuela, and El Salvador, but for very different reasons. There are very different dynamics there. So Brazil is on a treacherous course. It is not alone. It is in global company here. And I want to reiterate what our speakers know. We, if we look at the polls, it seems that Lula is slated to win the first election and the second election. I don't want us to lose sight of this. Lula is slated to win. But as has been noted, Bolsonaro has been preparing the ground to discredit those outcomes and to engage in all the kinds of actions that have been noted. So this is just the backdrop for the questions I want to pose to our speakers. Because in some ways, the question for me as a political scientist is less why has Bolsonaro done this? We can come up with many reasons for this, but more, why is he able to do so? He's one person. So this question of why this one person has the institutional, social, and economic support to move forward, to me, is the question both to explain why we are here and also where we can go, where we can expect to go going forward. In other words, not only where's the support, but where are the institutional guardrails to hold them back should there be these kinds of anti-democratic and insurrectionary moves. So for Angela, I have so many questions for you, but I think the ones I want to really emphasize here is, in light of that question, you highlight that Brazil has a lead, citing um, uh, 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 other work, an elite that never really civilized engaged in a civilized move. In other words, always accepted violence, didn't engage in that kind of civilizational move where they would not rely on political violence to go forward. And I want to really encourage you, invite you to elaborate on that particular point, because I'm trying to think about what that actually means. What would be an example of a civilized elite that would accept violence? Is that about manners and refinement? That's sort of the term that, for me, that civilization evokes. Is it about outlook and ideology? In other words, it's your ideational understanding of how society should organize, less liberal, maybe more autocratic in their thoughts. Or as a political scientist, I just want to throw out, is it about material and political calculations? That if you use it when it's convenient, you can be tolerant when it's convenient when you're not threatened, but you deploy violence when you can't ultimately get what you want. Of course, Brazil is so unequal, that comes forth. So I really want to ha invite you to elaborate on this point because I think it's a part of your key to explaining why violence is um, in the forefront now. And relatedly, why is it being deployed more now than previously? What is it about this particular context? If there's a long durée argument about not being civilized, why this moment um, uh, in play? 
I have lots of other questions for you about the Brazilian myths, because of course there's the, the myth of Brazilian racial democracy and the myth now of political violence and why those myths take hold, I think raises the question of who believes them and is this a myth that the elite believes but others do not? So I think that would be interesting. For Miguel, I, I have a kind of related question but in a different way for you which is you highlight that Bolsonaro has been able to use words. We don't quite know if those words are gonna come into action. And I wanna understand from your perspective, why people support him. You've told us who supports him as did Angela, but what is the basis of that appeal? One could argue it's an argument about support because people believe in what he represents, although they're, it's a pretty broad coalition. It also could be an argument of a kind of negative coalition, as Mark, uh, as Mark Weisinger has noted, of people are just frustrated with the alternatives. So is it actually a belief in this revolutionary project, whatever that entails, or is it actually a coalition of discontent where they don't see alternatives in the collapse of social movements and other political parties going forward? In other words, how has society changed from from the first election to now, where he's been able to not just win the election, but sustain it going um, forward. Of course, the question of what his end game here, you've kind of answered this at the end, but I'm not sure I know what, what his end game really is. And I think thinking about it in parallel with Trump would be really interesting. Okay, I'm sure I'm at my time, but let me just end with some comparative questions for us all to think about, which is, again, as a political scientist, I think the question going forward is, how does one rebuild <clears throat> institutional trust, political and social organizations, and those institutional guardrails that seem to be, you know, thrown to the wind. And by the way, one used to say in, in political science about Brazil that Brazil had weak institutions, had weak political parties, had a lack of trust. And then during Cardozo's administrations and Lula, there's a sense of them growing. So, uh, you know, we know that it can happen. How does that happen thinking about going forward? Two final things and then I'll stop, which is material conditions were notably absent in our discussion today. And I think it's really striking that during the Lula years, this was a period of commodity booms that made all kinds of things possible in terms of delivery. And we've been living in a period of relative, comparative economic crisis relative to those boom times. So what is it about material conditions, the loss of status, the loss of access to certain kinds of economic resources, the lack of access to certain kinds of social services that might be stoking this moment? In other words, do material conditions matter? They weren't as present in these presentations, maybe because Brazilians always think about inequality as being just a given everybody knows, but this is a broader audience. And then finally, I think the role of international politics is clearly in the background to all of this, because on the one hand, one could say that there's a process of international diffusion. In other words, we see that there's autocratization happening around the world. People protest. But it's still happening. It's not as though those guardrails in place. So to what degree is there international diffusion where <coughs> Bolsonaro is looking at what's working in other places and not? And again, what are the constraints that countries can play? And actually, Miguel, in your New York Times Peace article, you noted that maybe countries can play that role. But it's an open question. International politics as negative diffusionary examples and international politics as forms of constraints. So that's more questions than anybody could answer, but it's an example of how generative the, the conversation is, how important and critical this moment is, not just for Brazil, but on a global scale. I really want to thank our speakers for their comments, and I'll stop there. We can move to the... Hey, or if you want to just, yeah, the speaker just want that, but at least, yeah. Our friend speaking needs to speak at the microphone. I was trying to, to pass my turn to, to Miguel because the, the questions that earlier were rising, they are too tough to answer, but it didn't work. So, no? Yeah. It's okay, it's working. Um, so, thank you very much. They are very thoughtful questions, and I probably 
we'll be thinking about that for a while. But I'm gonna give you a kind of short answer that well that I can I can do by now. Uh, the first thing that you you asked, I think in more uh, in more general terms, I believe for both of us is why is Bolsonaro able to do what he's doing, right? And I have been doing research um, on social movements that organized since 2013 and before actually since 2011. And there are um, a bunch of liberal, conservative, and uh, authoritarian movements that are organized since then, around 2000, I, I collected to, uh, to now. So that support is coming from the society and is a support that is rooted. And they are organized, they are very uh, well funded, and they are very skilled in using social network. They learned that before the left, and they are more efficient than the, than the left in, in, in doing that. And they, of course, count on those sectors that I already mentioned, we both did it, uh, the evangelical church, not all, we, we always talk about them in general terms, but many evangelical uh, churches and uh, many people from the agribusiness is also supporting him. So there is a support. So you, as a, a, a sociologist who has been studying social movements, I always say to, to my students, there is no spontaneous mobilization. A leader do not go there and say, let's go to the street. So someone is organizing them. And I think uh, there is a huge structure organized and part of that structure now counts with those uh, armed citizens, the Scots. They are uh, around the, the, the whole country. So I think he has support, unfortunately. Uh, as about the hardest question you placed uh, about civilization, it's more substantial or is instrumental. Uh, I think here the difference is that I'm a sociologist. So I believe, as Norbert Elias that, that I, I quoted, uh, uh, states, I believe that uh, you cannot sustain a, a way of organizing the social life in legal and political terms when the society is not, in a way or another, even silent, giving support to that kind of orientation. So I, I could quote Nazis, but I, I would say in, my, in the case I studied, that is slavery. So you, you, for centuries, you have a huge, especially in Brazil, a huge population of slaves that outnumbered their uh, masters and the, the institution worked it because it was seen as legitimate. So I'm talking about civilization in that sense, that in Brazil, civilization is not a way of life for, for everybody. We have a hierarchical society that's naturalized. And I think uh, my point is that especially the social elite is more prone to be in environments like that one to come here, talk about the country and sorrow about our miseries than to solve the problems there. So I think I, 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 I will include us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's a partial answer, but I'll keep that. As for the, the myth of uh, racial democracy and, and conciliatory democracy, I believe part of uh, this um, uh, crisis, because something that is under process, uh, is coming since the, the PT's governments, especially with the, the, the racial issue, came to the public agenda when uh, the affirmative actions started to be uh, uh, placed as a national politics. So we saw many uh, situations in airports and the universities 
when the this kind of uh, uncomfortable uh, feeling with the changes could be uh, observed. So I believe we have a, a process of problematization of that that came with the public policies and also with social movements, especially uh, the, the Afro-Brazilian movement started to have a more, um, um, how can I say, I don't know how to say that in English, but a politics of presence, right? So uh, I think that uh, perception that things were changing is something that was very important and that in the conflict came with that. And quickly, the mat material conditions. Well, as you as political scientists know, economic crisis means incumbent lose, usually. But now in Brazil, we are in a situation that the crisis is not so bad as it was. So I'm not uh, sure that we have, we are in, in a moment of such a deep crisis that we count against the government. The pandemic is, uh, is passed. Uh, the, the economy is going a little better. The uh, unemployment is going down. So we are in a so-so situation. Um, so unfortunately, he has uh, this kind of uh, optimist uh, discourse that he can, he can keep doing. Well, I can talk. Okay, thank you very much. Well, Deborah, thank you for. Um, ah, well, thank you, Deborah, for the remarks. And and uh, I think the the question that you raised for me specifically, uh, the um, why uh, why is there such a support uh, to Bolsonaro? I think this is the one million dollar question because, uh, well, as Angela mentioned, the material conditions are not the best. Uh, but we know, for instance, also in political science literature, uh, that um, well, there there are ways for an incumbent incumbent to um, to, to, do, to do blame shifting to uh, basically uh, de de responsible as I'm, uh, himself for, uh, for his government or for the actions of his government. So, um, I, I think Bolsonaro has been very successful on doing that. And the example of the pandemic, I think, um, he started with a blame shifting strategy even before, um, uh, there was a crisis. So in the first week he was already saying that basically it was not his fault. It was the fault of the governor. So he, uh, he completely changed the discussion around the pandemic in the second week of the pandemic in Brazil. Uh, and uh, and he, his narrative uh, won the public debate because for months we were debating what is more important, the economics or uh, health. And, and of course, it was not, it was not, a, it was not a, a, a normal debate. We shouldn't have, uh, have, uh, have been discussing it. Uh, but what I think it's important, I have three hypotheses that I think that we could uh, work to understand why Bolsonaro has such uh, a support from a Brazilian society, uh, at least from segments of Brazilian society. So the first one is um, uh, Bolsonaro really uh, is, is a hyper-connected president. Uh, and this is important because Brazil is a hyper-connected society. Uh, we are uh, amongst the, 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 the populations that not only use uh, uh, social media, but that spends time in social media. Uh, we, uh, the Indonesians, the Indians, so um, all countries where far right has been uh, uprising. Uh, but uh, so, so I think that the, the, um, the idea that, uh, that uh, the hours that you spend in social media and the way that you behave yourself in the social media, where you're not a person, but you're a profile and uh, everything that you say matters, and uh, the way that you connect to people and you rally uh, to causes or uh, people is uh, uh, comes from a profile and not from your true personality. Um, and Bolsonaro uh, is not only he uses well social media, he has a good strategy of social media, but he's completely embedded on social media. 
if, if, you, if you got like the people that are doing the social media of Bolsonaro and you put them working for Lula, you won't have the same effect. It's not only about uh, uh, technique, it's about something else. Uh, Bolsonaro is an influencer. The best thing he did in his whole life, uh, the only uh, um, place where he excelled was as an influencer way before becoming president. So when he starts the idea, uh, he starts using social media really well in 2013, and he, become, he becomes one of the most popular influencers. So from a, a mediocre congressman that he was, uh, he became like someone extremely important. And, uh, and this is important because the way that uh, social media connects, and especially Facebook, especially Twitter, uh, uh, is always through opinions. So uh, basically, it's the empire of the opinion that matters, and Bolsonaro has an opinion about everything, as everybody, every profile in social media should have. So we need to have an opinion on uh, how uh, Guardiola uh, has um, um, managed his team in the, last, uh, in the last game. We need to have an opinion about the election in Chile. Uh, we have to have an opinion about everything. But not everything uh, is an opinion. And Bolsonaro does that really well. So I think this is, there's something there about the sociability and, and the way that you, um, uh, of the profiles that, uh, that Bolsonaro uh, uh, is really strong uh, because of this link. So I, I'm not, I, I like Bolsonaro not because he represents my interests, like, uh, like a transactional relations, but because I agree with him. So I think this is new uh, because my profile agrees with his profile and because I connect with a lot of people that also agrees with him and with me. And I'm somebody uh, in this uh, social media. So I think this is very powerful and needs to be more, more studied. The second uh, hypothesis I have is that it's about the evangelical. And as Angela said, we have a diverse uh, uh, evangelical community in Brazil, but more specifically, the neo, uh, neo-Pentecostals in Brazil uh, are very influenced by uh, the North American churches here. And, uh, and, and, they, uh, and, and they are very Bolsonaristas more than the other evangelicals and Protestants and Catholics, etc. Uh, and um, the, it's not only that Bolsonaro is um, helping them, it's not only that Bolsonaro is defending their interests and the interests of the, their church, he is, but Lula also did that, uh, Dilma also did that, the PSDB, the party of Cardozo, the right-wing party, also did that. They were always instrumentalizing religion and, uh, and those churches in order to get votes, always. But it's different, Bolsonaro, because Bolsonaro... Uh, is connecting his speech with uh, a theological interpretation uh, that the new Pentecostals do about uh, about the world. So, for instance, for those new Pentecostals church, the, the 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 book of the Apocalypse is something extremely important, and uh, uh, some of the actions that Bolsonaro takes that for like uh, uh, um, atheist bourgeois left wing uh, communities would seem like completely absurd, uh, uh, like, for instance, not using masks during the pandemic. Uh, but, well, the reading of many pastors in Brazil was the pandemic was announced in the apocalypse. Uh, and in the apocalypse, it says that uh, even though people uh, would like to, uh, are not aligning themselves with the devil, but they are wearing uh, the, uh, the, the, Mark of the Beast. How do you say this in English? Beast. Mark of the Beast. Mark of the Beast. Stain. The Beast stain. Uh, and the Beast stain is the mask. So when once, uh, uh, so when we see Bolsonaro not using masks with a, a super mortal pandemic, and we say he's completely responsible, uh, well, perhaps somebody has another uh, uh, reading of the situation. He's in fact doing uh, not using masks. Is not consigned to the devil. And we are the chosen ones. So, so I think this also, uh, uh, there's a, a link between a, a theological reading of politics that I think it's, it's important in Brazil in this moment. And the third one is what you mentioned, the negative coalition that I think it's definitely super important. Uh, Bolsonaro, what, what, what he does that is extremely powerful is that he says to someone who has power, uh, exert the power that you have, the micro power that you have. So, uh, if you're if you're a, a man and you want to beat your wife, it's not my problem. It's not the problem of the state. Uh, we should uh, uh, simply uh, deregulate. We should uh, fight against the feminists. All social constructions that were built 
uh, to uh, prevent uh, the uh, the abuse of power uh, in in all scales. It's something that Bolsonaro is constantly saying. Look, you can go go with it and 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 and. Uh, uh, and make whatever you do. So this is the discourse to the police. It's the discourse to the men. And, and I think that uh, in, in even in a very unequal society as Brazil, uh, this is something that is really strong because in a given situation you can exert power even if you're not necessarily a powerful person. But you can also uh, you can always exert power and, uh, uh, towards someone who's more fragile than than yourself in a given situation. So I think this is very powerful, and I think that's also explained. Uh, something that uh, explain or could help to explain why the elites adore Bolsonaro. Because it's not that they are, they're, it's in their interest to, to, to protect Bolsonaro, but they adore Bolsonaro. Not all the elites, of course, not the intellectual elite, but the economic elite in, 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 a, in a strong way adores Bolsonaro. And I think that could, could have something like that. I mean, the, the, the fancy clubs in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo have celebrated the victory of Bolsonaro as they never celebrate any victory of any right-wing candidates. Uh, so it's something that, uh, that speaks to, to uh, a little bit of what Angela was telling about our history and the behavior uh, of our elites. So that's it. Hey, uh, thank you so much, uh, Angela, Miguel, Debra, for uh, giving us so much to talk about. So in the kind of little time we have left, uh, so we'll take questions from the audience. So let me do the following. Uh, you can raise your hand. I'll sort of collect questions in bundles and then let you guys uh, figure out who wants to answer what? Uh, yeah, so, uh, go ahead, Pedro. Right. Oh, yes, that's a I, good... I, I can. Because <laughs> people are listening to... Yeah, I, I think, think the yeah, microphone yeah, is... Yeah. Uh, use these microphones, yeah. Thank you. I, I think it's been um, streamed, right? So uh, thank you so much. This is a timely, necessary, productive, scary debate, and I'm, I'm really... Happy to see you guys here. It's always good to, to see you again here at Princeton. And thank you for the organizers. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, Miguel, you sounded uh, less apocalyptical today than you sounded yesterday when we had, we had coffee. I had nightmares uh, last night. <laughs> um, uh, because you said yesterday, basically, uh, that uh, you you are afraid that... Uh, well, we know that Lula may win, but very likely will not win in the second, in the first round. But then you were afraid that in the second round, Bolsonaro might win in the ballot, in which case uh, they wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't need a January the 6th in Brazil. So I wanted to hear more about this, and I wanted to know if... Um, Angela shares this uh, green uh, view. And the other question is about this $1 million uh, question. How is it possible? I, I, I agree with you. I think it's a, it's a very uh, profound explanation. I mean, civilization, slavery, uh, this uh, sort of release of instincts that is related to, to the um, abolition of certain uh, policies and the idea that you can do whatever you want and uh, the state is there to really prevent you of doing what you should be doing because you, you have your individual rights, et cetera, et cetera. And this is very much uh, close to, to what we have seen and are seeing here in the U.S. as well. But then I, I, my question is more like theoretical. If we are not here in need in general, whether it's uh, to talk about Brazil or to talk globally, if we need a sort of a, co a new concept of the political, and I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally using Carl Schmitt's uh, uh, phrasing here, because it seems that we, we don't have, at least we are in a moment when we don't have actually uh, political subjects guided by rational goals, but we have something else uh, that needs perhaps to be uh, discussed in terms of irrationality or theology. I don't know. We we have something different here. So are we uh, short of uh, conceptual tools at this point to understand what is going on? Thank you so much. Your uh, two questions here. Uh, yeah, Ego, go ahead. I uh, I want to thank both pro, uh, professors Al Alonso, Lago, Yasha for the excellent presentations. I'll try to be brief. Uh, aren't you, Professor Lago, uh, exaggerating the level of support. Thanks. Aren't you, Professor Lago, exaggerating the level of support between elites for Bolsonaro? Because what elites mostly support Bolsonaro? It's agribusiness, and it's like uh, the lumping billionaires, such as the 
Veil Davan and, <laughs> and the guy from uh, Multiplan, the shopping malls and all that. Uh, the banks are not overly supportive of Bolsonaro. Uh, Fies Pinal with the son of uh, José Lencar aren't as well as support, isn't as well as support of Bolsonaro. Uh, and, he, and he lost some support elsewhere. You mentioned the truckers. The truckers aren't as supportive of Bolsonaro as they were in 2018. So he, he is very capable. Bolsonaro is very capable of mobilizing enormous uh, number of people, but that's kind of to be expected for a guy, for a president who is uh, using the bully pulpit and uh, and his 30-something level of support continue, continually for the past three and a half years and before that. So, I, I don't know. I, so, my, my first question is this. Uh, I still think you may have been too apocalyptic uh, in the as, as uh, outlining the level of support Bolsonaro has. And, uh, and uh, the second question from both of you is, uh, to both of you is, how would a coup actually ensue? Because that, that's the question I've been thinking, I don't know, since, since 2019, and most of people on the left and center left in Brazil. So, because there's nothing, there's not a moment in Brazil such as a certification of votes, as in as in the U.S., there's no there's no January 6 moments that uh, that could serve as a choke point for an attack. Uh, tanks in the street, as in 1964, don't seem likely. So uh, uh, Bolsonaro doesn't have the support of the press as the the the, the coup mongers in 1964 had doesn't have the support of the commanding heights of the economy, to use Lenin's phrase. So I, I'm not denying that Bolsonaro wants a, a coup. Of course he does. But I, I just, I can't, I still can't think about how would a coup happen. And that's what, that's what I'm asking. Thanks. And yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Thanks. These were um, really excellent presentations and um, that I, I guess my, my question begins from a, a similar starting point as Tiago because these presentations made me uh, feel strange in the position where I kind of want to say well let, maybe we should defend the elite in Brazil a bit which is something I never thought I would say um, <laughs> maybe I hope I never say it again um, but it, it does seem that actually uh, the story with the elite in Brazil is a bit more complicated than it was in 2018. Um, and that, in fact, it, particularly with the reappearance of Lula as the candidate of, uh, of the center left, that, uh, he, you know, he, he's more acceptable to the elite in Brazil as a, can a presidential candidate than probably he ever has been as a presidential candidate. And given if we take Lula to be an avatar of the kind of inclusionary turn in Brazil over the last 30 years, I know that's that's a very rough way of thinking about it. Um, that, that suggests that perhaps there is a degree of acceptance on the part of uh, key segments of the elite with the inclusionary turn that has characterized Brazilian democracy up until whether you put it as 2016 or 2018 or wherever. Um, so, so that's the, f the first thing that I wonder. The, the second one speaks to this question of the political and, and redefining the political. Um, because, Miguel, when you talk about insurrection uh, this evening compared to your, your piece this morning about uh, coups and revolutions, it seems like insurrection is a much easier term uh, to go along with than those other ones as to what might happen. And it's very commensurate with Angela's discussion of a kind of persistent strain of violence in the Brazilian polity. Um, might a kind of post-Lula election uh, permanent insurrection be the kind of persistence of bolsonarismo that would be most likely compared to a kind of overthrow of an electoral result in the formal institutional space, and that becoming the kind of primary mode of the political um, in the short to medium term? If you can, uh, uh, I can answer like yeah, can pick and choose or 
I'll okay. decide who goes first. Okay, so uh, first, I hope I was too apocalyptic because <laughs> I don't want to see this uh, happening. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the first part. Uh, no, I agree with you that a part of the elite uh, uh, is against Bolsonaro, and I think a part of the elite was always against Bolsonaro. Uh, I, I think that the main, I think that the, the, the protagonists of uh, of um, of the letter that in in, in August uh, 11th there was a letter that was written a declaration that was written by uh, by Fedraban, well, signed by Fedraban, which is the well, Federation of Banks uh, by Firjan, oh, Firjan, sorry not Firjan, the Fiespi that is uh, the uh, the the industries of São Paulo but I think it's directly linked to the people who are uh, nowadays presidents of those institutions who are people that certainly did not vote for Bolsonaro in 2018. Uh, uh, we 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 don't see the same thing if we look at all of the other federations of industries apart from São Paulo, and even inside the Federation of São Paulo, it was really hard for the president to sign this letter. So I think that, of course, we have a, a, an elite that an economic elite that has never supported Bolsonaro, and they are resisting to Bolsonaro. And I and I think that we uh, need to value that. And 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 I know many people in the elite that that are fighting Bolsonaro since the beginning. But I think that um, if you look at the, the majority of the federations, uh, the corporate federations in Brazil, uh, they are aligned with Bolsonaro. I don't think it's only the agribusiness, because also in agribusiness you have some of the billionaires of the agribusiness that are with Lula. So it's uh, it's so I think it's something that is uh, that is very uh, uh, very strong in our perhaps not in uh, among the. The, the most uh, known, perhaps, or, or uh, 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 billionaires of Brazil, but it, but but certainly something that I, I, when you look at the way that business is organized, I think there's there's still a lot of support, uh, at least on official support to Bolsonaro on those uh, uh, federations and corporations. Uh, but I, but uh, so this is the second thing is that about the coup when when Bolsonaro could uh, give the coup if he tries to give the coup. Uh, I, I really don't know uh, which will be the the most strategic moment, but I don't I don't see a possibility of a coup in Brazil. Uh, I see the possibility of an insurrection of, of perhaps something that we could call a revolution because it's extremely popular. But but I'm I'm I don't see a possibility of the coup. I don't see a, a, a 64 again in Brazil. I I, I I can't imagine the army doing that. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I but I I. I I think it's easier to imagine that than to imagine that the army will fight for democracy. This, I think it's... Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the, um, if there is an insurrection, it will be a chaotic insurrection because everything that Bolsonaro does is caught. So, so I, I don't think there will be um, a specific date. Uh, I think it's something that could pop up in many states in Brazil and then uh, uh, galvanize and, and start... So, I, I don't know w what will be Bolsonaro's strategy. Uh, uh, in this case, um, and, um, and 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 moving a little bit um, uh, to 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 what you just you just said uh, is that um, I I I agree that that um, that the as I said the, the degree of support of the elites is not exactly uh, uh, that that strong, but I still think that the corporations are are are, are fighting uh, and are are, are are with Bolsonaro. So. The second thing is about the political that uh, Pedro mentioned, um, and uh, I agree, Pedro. I think it's uh, we have a problem with well, well, the idea of political of Carl Schmitt. Uh, I think it's something that liberals and Marxists have a problem dealing with this, right? Because uh, liberals tend to not look at uh, at politics uh, as as adversarial politics, and uh, Marxists only see adversarial politics as uh, with a with a frame of of, of class struggle, uh, so I so I think that um, that other thinkers uh, uh, thinkers on uh, radical democracy populism could help. Uh, I think they have more suitable frameworks to understand Bolsonaro, uh, etc., than the traditional Marxists or traditional liberals to understand that. But I agree with you. I think we don't have enough tools to understand uh, uh, Bolsonaro, and. Um, and 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 about the uh, the opinion about the election, I think that 
uh, I was extremely negative yesterday because I just had just talked to Angela before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think I think Lula. I, I think that Lula uh, is probably who who's going to win the election, but I don't uh, see. Uh, well, I, I I think it's uh, I think I think it's most probably it won't be in the first round, uh, but I see a possibility of Bolsonaro winning the second round as well. So uh, so I think this is something that we should uh, bear in mind. It's my fault. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all for, for the, the good questions, hard one ag again. Uh, I think that there is a point that I, I haven't mentioned, but that helps us to explain or at least answer part of the question here is that's concerning to morality. I don't think that the support to Bolsonaro is, is uh, given just because of there are some strategical vote. Uh, when you, th that numbers that I, I showed to you during my, my, my presentation, Bolsonaro is overrepresented on those groups. But it's not just the vote that is overrepresented. When you, you see how those people, um, think about religion, marriage, abortion, and everything, they agree with Bolsonaro on that. Uh, so what I think he, he represents the most is a kind of moral community in the sense that he, he is all the time, as he did today, saying that men are superior to women, uh, heterosexuals are superior to other uh, sexual um, uh, groups that the the white people are superior to the to to the other ethnic groups. So he, he reinforces that all the time, uh, in a way that n n nobody else had done before in Brazil. So he speaks out some beliefs that were put uh, under the carpet during uh, the political correct years of Pichi's government. In that sense, I think he's very similar to, to Trump, you know? He speaks out a lot of people's minds. And so that's why those uh, men that uh, uh, Miguel was mentioned, they, they are very happy with him because they feel represented. And so in this sense, I think he's an, a traditionalist. He's all the time reaffirming that. And so uh, when uh, you ask, Pedro, if we, if we need another concept, I think that depends on what you, we are uh, um, defining as rationality. Because uh, this group, it seems to me that Bolsonaro and Bolsonaroists, what they, they do uh, perfectly, unfortunately, is that they are very um, good in uh, manage the rationality of emotions. I think there is a rationality uh, there as well in the psychanalyst sense or the, it's about that rationality. So when you, you look to the, the discourse, they are not framed in logical terms. I think the best example is one of the Bolsonaro's uh, sons, Carlos. I follow him on Twitter, and many of you, if you should. <laughs> yes, no. uh, there was a joke in Brazil some, a, a year ago, I think, that if you would like to, to, do, uh, um, to write a tweet like Carlos do, you write any sentence in one language, and then you put in the Google Translate <laughs> into any different language, and then the, 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 there you are going to have a sentence because there is no uh, structure, there is not a, a, a way of thinking there, you know? It's not that kind of rationality. But he communicates, it's a feeling that is, is, is communicated. So I think there is a kind of rationality of emotions that they, they manage very, very well. And, but of course, new concepts are always welcome. And, <laughs> and, as for the coup, 
uh, as uh, Thiago uh, mentioned, uh, I think that as we see, if, if, if you look at the day after of all cooks, uh, there is not exactly a key moment that the, 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 the cook occurred. It's a process, right? So what we have been seeing in Brazil is that institutions uh, have been failing in control Bolsonaro in the last three and a half years. So that's the process of uh, democratic institutions failing all the time. Uh, every time that someone has to go on Twitter or TV and say, the democratic institutions are working is because they are not, right? You don't, you, you don't have to, to say that all the time. So I think it's a process. In, in, in that sense, we can be trans, in, in a transition for something else, for an autocracy, as you mentioned. I don't know, but it's a possibility. What I, I, I'm as a pessimist, I, I'm a pessimist. Uh, I think it's more um, it's possible. It's that in case Lula wins the election, and I, I think, contrary to you, I think Lula will win the election. Uh, I think political violence will take the streets. And so they are going to fight the Lula supporters. They are going to uh, go to Lula himself. With So this kind of more uh, so social diffused violence, I think, would be more important in terms of disaggregating uh, democracy than uh, the army going in, inside the Congress. And if they go for one institution, they certainly will go to the Supreme Court. Bolsonaro has been all the time uh, talking that the Supreme Court is that uh, is uh, preventing the, the, him to, to govern. So I think that's the most probable. Um, but I, I, I promised in the beginning that I, I'm not an astrologist, so <laughs> I'll stop here. Uh, we're pushing a bit on time, but like if you can get collect a couple more questions and then round it off. Uh, so, uh, Joan, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, riveting conversation. Uh, you talked very little about the Workers' Party and and the left. You talked very little about the Workers' Party and the left. And I we have very few minutes, but let's say if you were to be able to talk to Lula's campaign, you know, what would be like one or two to do things to wrestle with this complex authoritarian figure and process, right? And then I uh, the question I would like maybe to bring Deborah back into the conversation because Miguel, you ended your editorial in the New York Times today saying calling on the United States to 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 engage the situation, you know, really to to take to take uh, stock in this in its own democratic tradition and values and forms of mobilization. So I wonder, Deborah, where do you see this? How do you see this playing out, like internationally, in terms of like which kind of Activity could be done, mobilization, diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. Just, just, just to throw it, the conversation back to you because your questions were just so fabulously important. And there was one more. Uh, Angela, Miguel, I wish to connect the, my question with the previous discussion. Okay, it's a little bit orthogonal to, to the last question, but I think it's important. You both mentioned the possibility of an insurrection movement, uh, and, and uh, you commented some sectors of the society which are more prone to support this, the, the traditional Bolsonaro supporters in, in the economical elite, in military, other, other guys. I wish to talk, in, in case, let's suppose, I believe this will happen. I don't know the scale, if in small scale, like uh, Flamengo and Vasco after a match, or if this will take several weeks. Or, But in case uh, we have an insurrection movement uh, and it may scale up, which se other sectors of the society you think are more prone to organically move, uh, move in the direction to support this because it's scaling up or in the opposite situation. It, is, it starts and scale down 
very quickly which groups among the supporters, the traditional supporters, are more prone to fall down very quickly from the support to to this kind of uh, anti-democratic movement. And I think there's one last one. Yeah, there was one last one here. Oh, great. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you not about the future, but about the past. The standard Brazilian politics textbook says that transition to democracy was relatively successful. It was late in coming, but it was successful. So the big book, uh, 1999, called Democratic Brazil, it's optimistic. Then 10 years later, there's a second book, and it's called Revisiting Democratic Brazil. And he goes, well, half full, half empty. The third edition, 2010, 17, it's called Democratic Brazil Divided. <laughs> and my question to you is, surely we are living under a lot of political decay now, but surely the cause of decay is not just Bolsonaro, dreadful as he is. So my question to you is, should we not be rewriting the story of Brazil's transition to democracy? Because just listening to you now, it looks as if this was a far more checkered question, partial process of democratization that what the standard literature suggests. And I think it was one last question. <clears throat> uh, the majority of studies dealing with uh, political science and religion in Latin America usually deal with religion as a catalyst for uh, radicalization and nationalism. What, what would you say to, to religions what they can do to stop uh, these sorts of of uh, radical of of of, na of of nationalisms, or in what ways can religions be not just catalysts for nationalization, but moral breaks against authoritarianism? Yes. Uh, Wants to go first. I just jumped the queue because I don't know if you heard, I wanted our speakers to have the last word. I didn't want to be the last person. Um, so thank you, Joao, for your question. But if I could boldly revisit some of the earlier questions, because I loved the questions and the responses, I, I just want to really emphasize that what I'm taking from the comments is that we really have to think about politics, maybe to this point, beyond material conditions and class and to recognize the moral backlash that happened against this earlier period. Right. So if we think about the earlier support for, for Lula, it was very much based on an understanding of class and also an uh, aspiration for more racial democratization and inclusion along all kinds of dimensions. And Angela, you, ha you highlight for us the, the many ways, as did you, Miguel, in your comments about how it's not just certain elements of class, not class writ large, but certain class elements along with religion, along with race, along with gender that created a moral backlash in response to an inclusionary term, but also a collapse of a political party system and social movements that, by the way, the other word we didn't mention, which not only lost momentum, but also in the context of a major corruption scandal. So that 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 distrust in the system also was 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 consequential. And I think that emphasis of thinking about morality and moral coalitions, but in the context of a backlash, um, particularly for those who lost steam, to me, that parallel with, with Trump is a really striking one and one to, um, to consider. So that's the first thing, if I could, I wanted to note. The second is, I think this question, um, Pedro, that you asked that I might partially flip parallels something I've been thinking about um, today, which is that the political response and the po and politics alone isn't only going to happen in the context necessary. well, maybe be less dramatic here. I don't think the only possible solutions are respect the elections and a coup and insurgency. I think the other scenario is the one that you just highlighted, which is ongoing disobedience in the streets, both in general, through the media, at the local level, at the gubernatorial level, at the courts. There are all ways in which disobedience can happen. And I, I think that scenario is equally, if not more likely, that there will be a big up upsurge in response to having lost. That's already prepared. It's going to be words. There might be some actions. I want to hope that those actions will be contained in some way, but I think that it's stoking the 
the fire in a way where there will be sustained disobedience because institutions are not respected, information is not respected. That's a parallel with what's happening in the United States as well. And that's a kind of paramilitary, parastatal, more disaggregated, diffused response that that you folks highlight. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that and emphasize that. And I think this speaks to your question, Pedro, because in part, politics then is no longer just about elections. Well, liberal electoral democracy is no longer just about elections, respecting the elections, and then going back in a Schumpeterian way. It's about all the politics that's happening on the day-to-day and in all forms of ways with a hyper-mobilized society, as Miguel noted, where people no longer feel as though they're going to vote and step back because they can engage in politics in very low-stakes way with very high-stakes outcomes on a day-to-day basis. In that sense, politics is no longer elections alone might lead to a Marxist interpretation, it might lead to other kinds of interpretations, but it's happening in all kinds of ways. And the question is when it scales up and when it doesn't, because it's so diffused and yet so hypermobilized. So to that degree, I think we do need new ways of thinking about political participation in ways that are deliberative and destructive. And then finally, Joao, I don't know how to answer your question because I'm not really an international relations scholar, although John is, and maybe he has something to say here. But I would note that I I think that there's a, both a symbolic response and I think there are other kinds of responses. At a minimum, the Biden administration, if the negative scenarios play out, has a symbolic obligation to Um, speak out against those sorts of dynamics. The question is whether or not other kinds of responses would occur, political, material, et cetera. And there, I would just caution against a unitary versus a collaborative regional response because the U.S. acting alone can just recreate dynamics of imperialism and colonialism in ways that can generate all kinds of spill-off effects. But here's where the OAS, in collaboration with other democratic states could respond in other ways. So I wouldn't have a unitary response. Symbolically, yes, but in terms of actions, not without uh, other dynamics. And here I'll stop. Okay, thank you for for the questions. Um, I'll start with Matthias. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think we have this very optimist um, reading of what happened to us in in the last decades. So we we when I I, I say we I say uh, people like us who write in the press, but most of the academics studying the, the cases. There was a kind of belief in the, the, the democratization. There was a fascination uh, in in Brazil, including uh, international scholars with the participatory process, uh, the rights that the Constitution guaranteed. And and so nobody was looking for the other side. This is a conservative traditional society that all of a sudden uh, creates a very progressive uh, Constitution and this is going to be just improve, improve, improve it. See uh, Chile now. So that constitutions do not represent the country. And in many ways, the 1908 constitution do not represent Brazil. That's the point. And so I think the the scholars deny that. They, They did not look at that. And so what we are seeing now is not new. That's why I started my presentation saying just new right, new new that is not new. They are just uh, we are just paying attention to them now because they are in the government, but they were in the society before. And as for the other side, for the the drunk uh, question about PT in the left, I think the left has part of the. Uh, is part of the problem we're facing now. During Lula's government, um, I'm writing a book about that that period, so I'll I'll do a a, a short sentence, but believe me, I'm doing the the search. (laughs) During Lula's government, uh, many uh, movements and the government itself, 
the, the uh, movements in the socialist field, they engaged in that idea that participatory spaces were superior to representative institutions. They did part, and uh, again, the scholars did part of that as well. Mm -hmm. They were saying that it's better when people part, part, uh, do the participation directly. So they put representative institutions in doubt. And the new left, the new uh, anarchist movements, the autonomous movements, they uh, are totally against representation in any sense. They question that. And they, it, as the, 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 this right, they are talking about using political violence as a legitimate tool for political practice as using the uh, black bloc tactic. So I think part of the problem came from the left itself. It's not just that the other side was organizing, but that this side was also questioning the, uh, why to have this kind of representative democracy. So you have a confluence of things going on uh, here. And quickly about religion. Well, I think that uh, we have part of, and uh, many polls have been uh, showing that we have uh, Catholic, most of the Catholics and most of the Afro-Brazilian uh, religions and the other uh, religion minorities, they are not supporting Bolsonaro in the same level. But uh, I'm, I won't trust that they will uh, organize in a way to, um, you know, fight him. So, I think if, if I, I can have one last word about corruption that I'd like to, to, to just point that as corruption is, is a kind of um, sliding word that you can use to talk about morality and economics. And most of it's part of the, lead, the the economic elite that we have been saying that they are not support they, they are supporting Bolsonaro. What they say, and part of those more centrist Democrat PSDB people say, never in this country, no one uh, robbed as much as PT. Well, we do not have numbers. As scientists, we cannot say that. Politics can say that, but you cannot accept that as a, a fact, right? So you cannot compare. But that's now a kind of mainstream in the media and, and every uh, place that you look to. And so there is just this, this uh, that is, is very useful for Bolsonaro's discourse because he says, uh, we, have economic, uh, we have political and moral corruption, and I'm going to fix both. Thank you. Uh, so, so the um, the scaling up question. Uh, I think that if if there's an interruption and if uh, it scales up, uh, if it's in the second round, right? If if Lula wins in the first round, it's but it's uh, but I I I don't think that will happen. Uh, it won't scale up, in my opinion, because. The scaling up uh, would need the uh, in the second round uh, would need the support of um, a part of the status quo, <laughs> and and I think that the political status quo, which is called the centrão, that is very corrupted, and in this moment they are with Bolsonaro, they were with Lula, they they will be with Lula, uh, but but the fact is that uh, the the centrão could uh, participate to this this venture after the second round, not in the first round, because in the first round is the moment where they get elected as congressmen. So they have spent millions to get elected and they don't want to redo an election uh, after that. So, uh, but, but, I, but I think that in the scaling up, I see this as, as an opportunity and a part of the army because we need to, um, uh, we have, I think, 8,000, between 6,000 and 8,000 people uh, from the army working in civilian roles uh, uh, inside the, the federal administration, which is completely absurd. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think that the army will do a coup, but again, if, if there is a scaling up, why not support indirectly? Um, uh, the, so that's, uh, that, that's how I see. 
the the question to Lula, I don't, I don't know what I will say to Lula, but I uh, I think that Lula uh, has a strategy that I don't think uh, it's um, I mean it's 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 a good strategy because it's it's working to a certain extent, but it's but it's uh, I don't think it's enough because Lula, what he's saying, he's only speaking about the past. So when I was the president, we had a good time. You had a good life, uh, and this is true, and uh, and this is strong. Uh, but I think that again, his uh, he needs to to also create desire uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, electors of the two um, to win this election. So I think that he he should be speaking a little bit more about his vision for Brazil and his vision for Brazilian society. That that is something that Bolsonaro makes very clear. Uh, and this is something that we didn't mention, but the the uh, the idea of creating horizons of expectations, Bolsonaro does. Lula is creating a, well, he's mentioning a horizon, but that passed. Uh, so, so I think this is something that that should be definitely something that they should be doing, in my opinion. Um, then, just getting here the about the uh, about my statement, I agree completely with you, and uh, and I think we need a to some extent a new transition. Uh, again, I think there's something that I think the election of Bolsonaro means something uh, for for this transition uh, uh, and for for the for the democratic period that we we've we've been living since '85. Uh, but but I think that it's again something didn't work out as as Angela said about the constitution. Uh, I, I have the impression that uh, I have a different impression from Angela that I think that. Uh, uh, the PSDB, the PT, the PMDB, they were, uh, they, they wanted to create a, a democratic government, but they didn't care to create a democratic society. Uh, so I think that, uh, I think the PT cared about that before becoming government. But once it was in government, social movements should not uh, mobilize themselves, should be in the government working with us and supporting the government because there's always the right wing that is uh, uh, staging a possible uh, 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 defeat for us in the next election. So I think that um, uh, while the traditional social movements uh, that, were, that were extremely strong in the 90s, I think they lost a little bit their strength and their touch with the streets during the Lula's administration. And that also explains the autonomists uh, in 2013, uh, uh, that, uh, that the new social movements that were not represented or not linked uh, to this democratic transition. And, and, and uh, so I think that we... The election of Bolsonaro, uh, to some extent, I'm not a historian, but I think it's it, perhaps it ends this period that we have a democracy, and we should definitely, if Lula gets elected and if Lula uh, is in office or another third, uh, I mean another democratic uh, candidate, um, uh, but but if it's not Bolsonaro next year, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think they're they're Ciro <laughs> Tebich, I don't know, oh. yeah. <laughs> So that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, then I don't know, but uh, again, the um, but again, if it's not Bolsonaro next year, I think that certainly the next president should uh, convene uh, uh, for for an. an uh, I, I don't think it's a new constitution, but I, I don't know some some kind of of of, uh, of reflection about the country. And again, I think that the bet on a democratic society is something that is extremely important, and uh, I think that. Yes, we have a more conservative society, but I also think that Bolsonaro has radicalized this conservative. So, uh, so I think that uh, Bolsonaro is trying to shape uh, Brazilian society much more than any Democrat uh, tried to do uh, under the other governments. Uh, and, and finally, uh, about the religion, I think that religion has a role there uh, in, 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 and that it's important. Uh, if you look at the... Um, the differences in the polls, uh, the Catholics is 52% Lula, 25% Bolsonaro. It's, uh, it's gigantic. If you look at more historical uh, Protestant churches, uh, we don't have exactly those numbers, but I, I'm sure it's much more like the Catholics than, uh, than the, the neo-Pentecostals, where probably, Lula, uh, probably Bolsonaro has 80%. Uh, so it's, if, we, if we split these different religions, I think there's a lot of difference that we can find there. Of course, there are many Catholics that are extremely conservative and loves Bolsonaro, and you have uh, neo Pentecostals who are leftists. But but it's but I, I mean, in, in terms of of religion, I think it's important uh, to have not the not not pastors and 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 uh, and uh, priests 
in the um, uh, in the in politics, certainly not. But I think that uh, perhaps in this the creation of democratic society, I think that perhaps there's a discussion between religion uh, or at least uh, some spirituality that should be uh, infused in a democratic society. We, we I don't I don't think that a democratic society is only a, an atheist society or um, as so. I think it's something that uh, that uh, that should be. Uh, it certainly will bring uh, something to this discussion. That's it. All right, yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Angela, Miguel, Deborah, for uh, giving us so much to uh, think about it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone, watching from home. Before you all clap, <laughs> important, uh, important announcement. So there, we have a reception upstairs. It's actually exactly above us. So if you just walk outside, take one, go up the stairs, just one floor that, that, that will be in the right place, uh, the atrium of the Louis A. Simpson building. Uh,